So what I'm doing here is really giving some context for Julia Morgan. Often we talk about, like we talk about Asilomar or we talk about San Simeon, but here I want to sort of give a broad overview of what she accomplished because there's so much more and some context for her work here at Asilomar. So I'm going to look at, first of all, her education and how her career developed. And the thing about her vast, her absolutely vast range of her works, especially related to women, and that, of course, gets us into Asilomar, which eventually gets us to Hearst Castle, which is pretty much the opposite of Asilomar. <laughs> There are lots of words that have been used to describe her indomitable, um, strong-willed, ambitious, and most often modest, that she did not promote her work. But I really picked a, a one particular word for her, which is grit, a popular word nowadays. But she met a lot of obstacles and overcame them through sheer determination. And you can see this from her education. She was, went to Oakland High School, and she excelled in math and sciences there. She always wanted to be an architect, but Cal did not have an architect school at that time, so she majored in civil engineering, which was a very brave and gritty thing to do. As you can imagine, she was the only woman in her class, but it gave her a lot of important background that really put her ahead of most of the male architects of the day because she understood technology and structure much more than most of the other architects did. She also, it also got her used to working with men, which she had to do for the rest of her life. When she was at Berkeley, Bernard Maybeck was hired. He came to this area as one of the most prominent local architects. And he actually tutored some people in architectural drafting and became her mentor. He also introduced her to the style or, or the aesthetic we know as the first Bay Area tradition or sort of like Brown Berkeley houses. <laughs> and this really influenced her work from arts and crafts um, standpoint. The other very important thing that he did is encourage her to go to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. That was the premier architecture school in the world. As you can imagine, they were not really excited about having a female applicant. You can see here that she was in Paris for six years. She had to go through a very strenuous process of getting admitted the process was that you would work with um, in a workshop in an atelier and work on particular projects, design projects, and then present these to the school to be ranked and judged for admittance. So she did it three times. The first time they say that she forgot to use the metric system, which is a problem. <laughs> The second time she did very well, but they didn't accept her. The third time she did so well that they had to accept her. And so she was there for um, several years. She did manage to get all her points. Again, you had to do projects that were ranked and you had to get a certain number of points. And she managed to do it just before her 30th birthday. For some reason, you had to do it before you were 30. She returned to um, Berkeley, and by this time, of course, they had an um, architecture program. And the campus architect and the head of the school was an architect named Galen Howard. And so she worked for him for a couple of years. She worked on the Hearst Mining Building, the Hearst Women's Gymnasium, and was mainly responsible for the design of the Greek theater, although she was not really acknowledged. During this same, same period when she was still working there, she got what was one of the most important 
commissions of her whole career, which was the Campanile or the bell tower at Mills College. Mills is a women's school in, in um, Oakland, and it had been given, gotten a donation of bells and needed something to do with them. You can see that she adapted the mission style. Instead of using what might be considered more typical an Italianate style, she used the mission style for the tower. She also, very importantly, made it of reinforced concrete. She was very interested and she was a pioneer in the use of reinforced concrete in many, in, um, many most of her buildings. And this turned out to be very fortuitous for her. She also did other work at Mills, including this really darling little um, Carnegie Library. I used a postcard because you know everything gets added on to. <laughs> so this was a very important part of her early career. She realized that with Galen Howard at, on the campus, she would never get appropriate recognition. And he was very pleased with her work. He was even more pleased with the fact that he didn't have to pay her very much. And so when she figured this out, she went off on her own. She was the first woman to earn a California architect's license. And she established her own practice in San Francisco in 1904. Um, we know that was not a great time to establish a practice in San Francisco <laughs> because her office was destroyed in the fire in April of 1906. And she opened a new office in the Merchants Exchange Building where she stayed for the rest of her career. But the fire was fortunate for her in one way is that the Fairmont Hotel had su survived the fire, except the interior had been destroyed by, by the fire. It sort of melted down. And most of the architects were either too busy or too afraid to take the job on. But she did. Again, she understood structure. She understood um, the use of concrete. And she was willing to work with the workmen. So she managed to put together this whole project in a short period of time. She met it, it, she finished it on time and within the budget, which again gave her a really strong head start on her, on her career and made her noticed by a lot of important people. I wanted to um, mention the, again the breadth of her experience she had more than 700 projects over about 45 years. She did have an office. She didn't work by herself. She had um, usually about half a dozen draftsmen and other architects working with her from, they said like from three to 15 or so, depending on the workload. But many, most of those, hundreds of those houses were, of those buildings were houses. There's were more than a hundred in Berkeley alone. Almost all her work was in California, especially in the East Bay and San Francisco. Since she had such strong connections with the university, her, word of her qualifications sort of spread throughout the university community. This, um, there are a lot of mansions like the, the house here. This is a mansion or a rural mansion at the Empire Mine in Grass Valley. And then these other houses are, you know, basically middle-class houses in Berkeley. She did not ser serve only the wealthy. She served a broad range of people. At the upper right is an actual cow barn <laughs> built for the Tevis Ranch. And she actually did, for her, she did radio towers. He owned station KYA and did radio towers. She was very client-centered. People have compared her with Frank Lloyd Wright because they had the same, um, eight, the same time period, but she would not promote herself and she did not impose her ideas on the client. She really worked with the clients to meet their needs and their style. So there are lots of different styles that she ended up using. 
She also did commercial buildings. The one on the left is the um, one of Hearst's paper, the LA Examiner, which is obviously a, a take on the, Span the mission or the Spanish revival, which was really popular at this time because of the exposition in San Diego. The building on the right was built as St. John's Presbyterian Church. It is now the Berkeley Repertory Theater. So you might be familiar with it. it she did quite a, quite a number of churches and similar things like the Chapel of the Chimes, which, was a, which is a um, mortuary. But what is one of the most fascinating things about her career to me is that she did so much work with women's organizations. She sort of fell into this because of her contacts. And the 1920s were a very important time for women's rights. As we know, in 1920, women got their federal right to vote. But the World War I had actually given a big impetus to women because they had proven that they could take over men's jobs and that they could organize and solve problems. And there were many women's clubs throughout the country. They were a major force. And by the 1920s, they were able to actually raise the money to build buildings, their, their own clubhouses. Probably one of the best known around here is the Berkeley City Club, which is, as you can see, quite a large building. It still is operated as a clubhouse and hotel today. More typical would be this um, Saratoga Foothill Club, which is a you know, much smaller building that operates as a clubhouse and event center. And so there are quite a few of these around California that she worked on. And you see her, the aesthetic, the arts and crafts Bay Area aesthetic <coughs> is obvious in that example. But it gets a lot more interesting <laughs> Um, she did a lot of re work for um, sisterhoods and organizations. The building on the left, as it says, is a residence for a Jewish organization. She did quite a few of um, these types of residences throughout the California, places where young women would go to live while they were working. This is now the San Francisco Zen Center. One thing I'd like to mention, the obvious is that when I started planning for this program, I had hoped to go visit these places, <laughs> um, to go to Hearst Castle and to go to Berkeley uh, and some other places, but obviously I haven't been able to do that. So, um, but her work is pretty well documented at this point. On the right side is one of the numerous um, hospitals or sanitariums that she did. This again was a project of a religious organization, King's Daughters. And you can see the scale of the, of the project here in this sketch in the newspaper. So this was a hospital for, um, they said the uncurable, maybe a rest home we would call it. So. But the major client she had during this time was were the YWCA, and she did dozens of buildings for YWCAs in um, 11 different cities. Most were in California, quite a few were in the Bay Area, and, but she did one, a large one in Honolulu, and one in Salt Lake City. And they, again, have a lot of different styles. The, Chinese one is particularly interesting because she sort of adapted some Chinese design motifs to, to make it fit um, what they wanted. So this brings us to Asilomar. The YWCA had been having regular summer leadership conferences I want to explain what Asilomar is because it, I think people sort of have the idea it was like, you know, a camp for kids, <laughs> but it was really much more than that. The, why at this time was focused on helping young women develop and grow into people who could 
be successful in the changing world. So they included education and leadership training. And they had these summer conferences. They had been meeting in a hotel in Capitola that burned down. And then Phoebe Hurst, who is, she's in the middle of this photo wearing, for some reason, a Chinese robe. And she was a national leader in the YW. She um, hosted the 1912 conference at her estate in Pleasanton. She must have had a large estate because there were 300 people in, in tents there. So she realized they needed their own conference ground. She was able to get a donation from the um, Pacific um, Company, which is now, the, now Pebble Beach. So she got a donation of 30 acres there next to Pebble Beach, what we call Pe Pebble Beach now. And they hired Julia Morgan to work on this. The, it opened in 1913, and they actually operated it up into the dep Depression. And they, the Y maintained ownership up until the state took it over in 1956, but it was leased out and managed by different companies, not very successfully over 20 years. This group here is the field committee, the people, the Western leaders that came around to look at all the sites. So Julia Morgan came out to look at the site and she saw that it was very important and very important environment. So she wanted to, to do buildings that were using natural materials and really fit in with the surroundings, sort of growing out of the dunes. So the first building that was finished, which you're probably familiar with, was the Hearst Social Hall in 1913. And you can see the use of granite and the unstained, the stained wood and logs were used throughout all the buildings. This um, plan helps explain this. The main part of the camp here is a National Historic Landmark District. And this map shows the historic part within this um, black border. The, the red buildings are the major buildings. So the social hall, the dining hall, the chapel, and Merrill Auditorium here. The blue buildings were built over time, over like between 19, 1913 and 1925 or so, to house staff and special guests. Then you can see all around here, these are buildings that were added by the state later. So the entire conference grounds nowadays is all of this. I'm not sure how many newer buildings there are, but there are a lot. <laughs> so you noticed I didn't mention that there was any housing for the attendees because they lived in tents. <laughs> and the last one of these, I guess, was taken down in 1971. So really throughout the time this functioned as a campground, most of the people stayed in tents like this. And then on the right, you can see they actually had a dining tent as well. The main purpose of this was this camp was education and leadership training. They had regular classes um, and activities, but they also had fun. And these are um, pictures that Parks has. I noticed the women on the upper left are well-dressed for the Pacific Grove summer. I don't know what the, the women down below are doing without wet, wetsuits. They must have been freezing. I'm a little worried about the woman on the right. If she's playing baseball, can she run in that skirt? I don't know if these, these pictures perhaps raise more questions than they answer. So the next buildings that were built, the, the three major buildings are the chapel, which um, is called a chapel and it was used as a chapel, but it was really their auditorium. And the interior can be divided up into small group areas so they could use it for classes as well. 
And then finally, in 1918, they got the dining hall. So they had to put up with the tent for five years. They built these basically as the money became available and people donated money to build these, these buildings. The dining hall is the one that has been altered to the rear because obviously when the state added new facilities, they had to expand the dining hall. So it's been expanded to the rear primarily. But you can see as we look at all these buildings, they have the same um, materials and they all go together, but none of the buildings is at all the same. They just sort of fit together. Then there were, as I said, several buildings, I think about five or six or so that were built for staff. Um, Pirate's Den is called that. It was built for the um, male staff who lived in it. And then the building at the upper right is um, one of the most elaborate of these buildings. It was built for special guests as a lodge. And all of these facilities are now available for rental. They're all part of the, the um, conference facilities. But the most amazing thing, I think, is the last of the buildings built in 1928, Merrill Hall. And you can see that a lot has happened architecturally between 1913 and 1928. This building still uses the same rustic materials, um, sandstone instead of the granite, the rough granite, but the same shingles. But it's a very imposing building. It's up on a hill that looks out over the beach and the, um, the whole campground, very refined. The interior has these amazing arches, um, pointed arches in the trusses. This is very similar to the St. James, St. John's Presbyterian Church, but it's just an amazing interior, especially it had seating for a thousand, which made it the largest auditorium in the Monterey Peninsula at that time. So as I mentioned, in 1956, the park, California Parks acquired this and they added many new buildings. They are by, they're in groups of like four buildings by different architects, but they all use natural materials and the dark wood shingles. So they all fit in. It's like a whole a whole family reunion of buildings because everything fits in, but everything, things are different. Then there are also conference facilities. I'm quite taken with this one that's all, that's all glass. It seems like it would be sort of, um, it would be hard to pay attention to a conference there. So the Hearst family was intimately involved throughout Julia Morgan's career. A little background on who the Hearsts were. George Hearst came out from Missouri in, um, for the gold rush and he did very well. He ended up making a vast fortune with mines in California, Nevada, um, Utah, I think, the, the Dakotas and Montana. So he had a really vast fortune. And when he was in his 40s, he went back and married a teacher from his hometown who was considerably younger than he, he was, Phoebe Apperson. Now, Phoebe was very interested in art and design. And when he died, she really began devoting herself as a philanthropist. She was a very serious philanthropist who actually studied everything, became very active in things. She was the first woman regent of the University of California. She was a real driver behind the campus design there. She donated um, several buildings, as I mentioned, and she was a national leader in the YWCA, as you, found, as you saw. She had educated her son. They had one son, Will, and she took him around Europe with a tutor to teach him about art and architecture. 
Little did she know <laughs> what she was <laughs> getting him into. So she died in 1919 of the influenza. And he had, her son had some newspapers, I think a couple of newspapers before that. But her death and inheriting the whole fortune made him go into overdrive. And he started buying a lot more newspapers and magazines. And he also started building. Before we get into um, looking more at Hearst Castle, I want to mention two things that are particularly interesting, I think. He, Julia Morgan did many projects for the Hearst family. Um, there's only one that's really widely known, but she did many projects, large and small. One thing that's, I think, of interest here is that Hearst bought property over the mountains into Monterey County. And this building, the Hacienda, was built sort of as a lodge. I, I'm not clear why they needed a lodge when they had San Simeon, when they had Hearst Castle. But it was in a rural area, it's still a rural area. It's located on Camp Hunter Liggett near Mission San Antonio de Padua. And it is still operated as a hotel. So I would love to go there. I didn't get the chance during the quarantine, but it still is operated as a hotel. The other thing, which I think is not well known at all, is you notice the strange building on the right? The Hearst family actually had another retreat um, before they used um, the San Simeon area. Their family retreat was near Mount Shasta on the McLeod River in a very isolated area. Um, they had some buildings there. Um, the main building burned and um, William Randolph Hearst wanted to enlarge their use of the space and he and Miss Morgan decided to make it a Bavarian village. So they um, built quite, there are several buildings like this that are covered, that are covered with very colorful murals. And it's called Wintoon, the, the, the area. Um, I would love to see it. It's extremely private. It's still owned by the Hearst Corporation and the Hearst, Hearst family. And there's, you know, you can't see it at all. I've been told that if you are rafting on the McLeod River at certain times of the year, you can see a little bit. But um, it's just, I think, you know, an amazing concept of what they have there. And this, by the way, is actually where Hearst lived when he went to, to retreats during the war because Hearst Castle was sort of exposed, obviously, to the West, whereas this is extremely private. So the castle area is called, was, it was called the Enchanted Hill. And George Hearst had actually bought the Rancho in 1865, and the family used it in sort of a rough way. They, they went camping there occasionally and would um, you know, go hiking and maybe fishing. But in 1919, he decided that he was tired of camping out. He wanted something more comfortable where he and his wife and the four sons could hang out. And he said, maybe a bungalow would work. Well, that le there was a, at least two problems with that concept. One is his collecting habit. He did not, you know, buy pictures here and there. He bought um, building parts. He built entire, he bought entire buildings. He bought religious things. This ceiling is from Spain here. He bought huge furniture. He bought fountains. He bought everything that caught his eye. And most of it was stored either in warehouses or at his mother's place in Pleasanton. So obviously he needed more than a bungalow to accommodate those things. The other is that by the time he met the actress Marion Davies, he was really interested in promoting her movie career and making a big splash on the social scene in Hollywood and also to entertain people 
from throughout the country and even the world as part of his um, publishing empire. So obviously, he needed more than a bungalow. So this is what they got. <laughs> These are um, old, obviously old aerials which show what the surroundings were like and are still like. That this is like a, a little compound at the top of the hill with a tremendous amount of landscaping. Now, the project lasted for a long time. They started in 1919. It was pretty much finished by 1938, but Julia Morgan went there nearly every week for that whole period of time because she was still had her practice in San Francisco and she was deeply involved in everything, including um, you know, helping oversee the workmen, the artisans. She and Hearst worked very closely. He was again, he was also very involved in every detail in making decisions. As I said, they had a shared dream for what this place could be. Um, I have a later. So this is a current um, aerial that shows what they have. So obviously there's the main building. And then there are three cottages, yes, things they call cottages, <laughs> which are absolutely huge. And then there's 123 acres of landscaping. It's a hilly site, so there are a lot of terraces. There are um, you know, a lot of gardens, separate gardens and walkways. There was a zoo. Um, that was one of the things that Hearst had. And I think there are still zebras there. I also read that the bison who were there originally were taken to Golden Gate Park to join that group of bison. But this gives you an idea of what the, the place is like. The, um, this is, these are sort of the iconic pictures. The tower, this il starts to illustrate though how they combined everything that caught his eye in this massive project. So the towers here are modeled on ones from a church in Ronda, Spain. The um, picture on the right is the entry courtyard to one of the um, guest cottages. The cottages were actually built first so they could live in those while the other building was being built. As I said, they combined everything and the things that, that he bought. So this is a, two of, these are two of the most well known as the public rooms, the assembly room, where the guests would gather before dinner. And you can see a massive fireplace. I don't know enough of, you know, I can't identify where each thing comes from. But it's, it's, um, tapestries covered the walls. This looks like it might be from a church here. And then this is the famous refectory where people would serve themselves from mustard bottles and ketchup bottles. But this, um, these flags are from the Palio in Siena. These are two examples of the private spaces. The, um, his private suite was the Gothic suite. And this is the Gothic study. He obviously was um, sued. He could obviously accommodate a lot of people in his study here since it's bigger than most houses, but um, a very strong Gothic influence here. And then there were bedrooms. He and Marion Davies had Gothic bedrooms in that wing. Then this is the Doge's suite, which is an Italian um, theme. Then, of course, there's the iconic pools. The Neptune pool um, on the left was, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, rebuilt. It, and it was enlarged and rebuilt three times, which must have cost a lot of money. And then the inter interior pool is um, also, well, now I wanted to go back because I wanted to go back to the aerial. One thing is that 
they were not finished with this. They still had dreams at the time that during the depression, even he was running out of money and the Hearst Corporation was getting really alarmed at how much money was going into this, money which they didn't really have. So they sort of slowed down construction during in the 30s. And then when you get into the 40s, you know, obviously the war meant construction couldn't really go on. And then after that, his health started failing. So really they finished up in about 1938, 37. But they still had big dreams. One is to put a north wing here and to add a fourth, a Chinese cottage, guest cottage. And so they, you know, had, they had endless dreams going on. So this is, again, the... Now you see how vast her, her work was. She was the first woman to receive an AIA gold medal, which is astounding in itself. It was in 2014, 57 years after her death. And you know, it's just hard to imagine not only that it took that long, but that there were no other women honored in that up until 2014. One of the reasons her, after the war, her, her work sort of dried up for several reasons. One is that her whole aesthetic, the whole, um, aesthetic of working with the natural materials, with different styles, was really out of fashion as modernism beca became more popular. It was not really what people wanted. So, but she had completed more than 700 projects and practiced for nearly 40, 50 years. It's well known that she did not promote herself. A lot of her materials were, demoli were destroyed although Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and the University of California both have quite large archives of her materials. But her work, her famous saying is that my buildings are my legacy, they will speak for me. And so that and the AIA gold medal will speak for her.